three years ago, a woman came to our food bank well-dressed in office attire. The look on her face showed fear, fear and shame. Confessing to our case manager, the first words out of this woman's mouth were, I know I don't look hungry. It's embarrassing to have to come to you for help. This woman, let's call her Jane, had made time in her workday to take the most difficult steps of her life, the three steps up to our front doors to ask for food assistance for the first time ever. For over a decade now, I've worked with an organization called the Hunger Coalition here in Sun Valley, Idaho. I started as a board member and eventually became the first paid staff member. Due to the Great Recession, we will soon be a staff of 14. That's right, the need has increased so drastically over the last nine years, we've had to grow from one to 14 staff. Our growth reflects a national trend. Across America, there are now over 60,000 food pantries. Many are buckling under the weight of increasing numbers of families forced to rely on them for longer periods of time. This dramatic growth in demand has catalyzed many to rethink how we meet this need. One in seven people in America rely on a food pantry to feed their families. Here in our community, it's one in six. Two years ago, the United Way introduced us to the ALICE project. ALICE is an acronym. It stands for Asset Limited, Income Constrained, Employed. I'll say it again, Asset Limited, Income Constrained, Employed. ALICE represents the growing number of individuals and families who are working. They're still unable to afford basic necessities like housing, food, childcare, healthcare, or transportation from police officers and mechanics to childcare workers. These are people we all rely on every day who are finding it harder and harder to get by. More than a third of households in our county and across the nation are Alice, struggling to make ends meet. That's one in three. To put this into perspective, take a look at the person on your left. Now the person on your right. One of the three of you falls into this category. This is not a problem of other people, other places, or other circumstances. This is happening here in our community every day to people whom we know and love. Jane is the perfect example of the Alice population. We learned she was caring for an ill and aging father, and after paying all of her household bills, filling her car with gas so she could drive her father to as many doctor's appointments and go to work, there wasn't much left for groceries, and she was forced to choose quantity over quality. In this case, it meant hot dogs, because hot dogs are cheap. Jane's extreme shame at asking for help prevented her from coming to us for far too long. After months on an unhealthy diet, Jane found herself 20 pounds overweight and suffering from her own health issues. She was facing diet-related illnesses like high cholesterol, type 2 diabetes, and obesity, simply because she couldn't afford to pay her bills without sacrificing fresh fruits and vegetables. Our nation's healthcare system is feeling the weight of the decisions that people like Jane are making every day. America is suffering from a poor health epidemic as more and more families find themselves only able to afford low-nutrient, high-calorie foods. What we've learned over the years is that receiving food assistance brings out so much shame that people will do whatever they can before asking for help. We found ourselves asking, do people deserve to live off hot dogs? and sacrifice fresh produce simply because it's too shameful to visit a food pantry? At the Hunger Coalition, we have a radical notion. Everyone deserves healthy food, regardless of income. And 
a dignified way to access it. We realize it may take more than a food pantry to accomplish this. Our success comes from engaging multiple partners in a shared goal through these three simple steps that every food pantry can take. Listen, engage, and unite. These three steps have allowed us to craft some innovative solutions. First, we listened to our community. We conducted a year-long community food assessment to better understand how community members felt about local food and food assistance. We met with 40 different groups in our community, listening to their stories, identifying mutual goals, and uncovering opportunities for partnerships. The assessment revealed some startling numbers. Unlike Jane, 46% of the people responded that due to pride and stigma, they would never seek emergency food assistance, no matter how bad it got. Half of them were food insecure, meaning they don't always know where their next meal is coming from. They said they'd be willing to work or volunteer in exchange for food, but they would never stand in our emergency food lines. This data demanded that we expand beyond our traditional food pantry-style programs. At our weekly food distributions, instead of handing people a pre-made food box, our families grab a grocery cart and are accompanied by welcoming volunteers as they choose the foods that will work for their families, from fresh fruits and vegetables to milk, meat, eggs, and more. This choice-style pantry model is gaining traction across the country, and it does preserve dignity. However, we realized this simply wasn't enough. In order to overcome the stigma associated with food assistance, we've had to rethink our approach and build a separate brand that doesn't involve the Hunger Coalition name. To do this, we knew it was critical that we engage others. So last summer, we engaged our partners in rolling out a new brand called Bloom. We hitched up a bright orange trailer with a fully functional kitchen and a library, and we towed it into underserved neighborhoods in our county to offer lunch, learning, and fun to children who don't have access to summer camps or public libraries or the safety net of school meals. We partnered with our community library and engaged 18 separate organizations in providing enrichment activities from drawing and dance to science and sports. The kids loved it, and neither they nor their parents had any idea it was the Hunger Coalition bringing them those healthy meals. So building on the success of those partnerships, we have now scaled Bloom to the next level, to unite our community around food. With the help of our local university extension office and several new partners, we recently broke ground on the Bloom Community Farm. At the farm, we're initiating programs that appeal to people like Jane. Programs like volunteering for veggies, where people can exchange some time at the farm for a basket of fresh produce. Sliding-scale community-supported agriculture, allowing families to pay what they can for a weekly share of veggies. And a mobile market, selling discounted foods grown at Bloom Farm to senior housing facilities. The best part of the farm is our youth internship program in partnership with our school district and other youth-focused organizations. Each year, the food will be grown by teenagers, perhaps from those Alice families who are struggling. The kids will harvest the food that they've fostered from seed to full growth. They'll run the mobile markets, selling the food they've grown to the elderly at the senior housing complexes. And they'll also be able to connect with older generations. They will be paid for the work they do. In addition to learning job skills, they'll also develop healthier eating habits. We've learned that if kids grow kale or beets, they are much more excited to eat them. They'll learn life skills 
and leadership skills that will benefit them for years to come. And perhaps will help keep them out of our food bank lines as adults. We aspire to break the cycle of poverty by empowering youth to make healthy choices and by connecting them with the land. Jane lost seven pounds in the first two months after eating the healthy food that we provided. She was so excited to have a table full of fresh, healthy food after months of hot dogs that she documented it for us through a photo project we conducted. All of the food in this photo came from our food pantry. We haven't seen Jane in over a year now. The last time she sat down to talk with us, she said her budget is still tight. But when all of the bills are paid, and if there's nothing left for food, she can relax a bit because she knows that we are here for her. Perhaps next summer she'll get out to the farm and volunteer for veggies, feeling the empowerment of growing her own food. So, what can you do to make a difference in your communities? There is not one solution that works for everyone. Each community has its unique needs and resources. What has worked for us may not work for you, but I guarantee that if you take the time to listen, engage, and unite, you will create powerful outcomes. Start small. Listen to those in your community who often don't have a voice. Engage bold and effective partners who don't just share your passion for improving your community, but who also have the capacity to take action. Unite with people who are willing to demand that healthy, fresh food not be limited just to those who can afford it. When we listen, engage, and unite, together we will grow communities that are healthy from the ground up. Thank you.